but I just bought this extremely practical garment like an hour ago um, here in Flagstaff at In Cahoots. And I was thinking, you know, I really wish that I was wearing it tonight in celebration of our new boss lady in her pantsuit. Um, but that's not actually what happened, and so I'm going to have to open this up for you guys to share uh, what's happening instead. Yeah, it's the cover of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. Um, and a kid this morning in the coffee shop in Prescott was like, hey, I like your shirt. And I was like, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, it's unfortunately appropriate, I feel. Um, I'm wearing that in, in observance of this time in our national lives. And I'm also wearing a, a locket that I inherited from my grandmother with a picture of both my father and my auntie, who are both immigrants to this country from South America. And so, um, you know, regardless of who you voted for in the days to come, um, I hope that we can train ourselves to be aware in public, to keep our eyes open to acts of aggression or persecution towards people of color, immigrants, our gay, um, bisexual brothers and sisters, transgender, and towards women. Notice I addressed everybody except white dudes. So white dudes, that's especially on you. Um, let's hold each other close in these times to come and uh, focus on our humanity. I think we're gonna need it. And on that uplifting note, I'm on book tour for my first novel. <laughs> and I sold out. You guys, I've been writing fiction since I was eight years old. I'm 40. It took a little longer than I thought it was gonna take. This is indeed the cover. I want to point out, for those of you who have been, you know, way down south, to Prescott, um, but this is actually Granite Mountain on the cover. It's an amazing photograph. Uh, made friends with a photographer. Her name is Lucy Wu. Milky Way, Granite Mountain on fire. She calls it Forces of Nature. It really seemed like the perfect cover uh, photograph for this book. It's a coming of age novel set in a little mountain town kind of resembles a little mountain town that you might know in the Southwest. Um, and it's a coming of age novel centered around um, environmental activism. Uh, and for those of you who know about this, the struggle to save the Verde River. So I would love to sell it all, to sell it to all of you, but um, as previously mentioned, I am out of all the books that I brought to Arizona. So. If you want a copy of it, you can get it online from Barnes & Noble. You can go to your local Barnes & Noble and order it. Or you can get the ebook from Amazon. So, um, However, if you would like to um, stay in touch with me and my awesome fiction set in the great state of Arizona, um, please feel free to leave your email address on my mailing list and take one of my free gifts. It's a little poem called Genesis. It's about a salamander. Um, it's an Arizona salamander. I think that's all I have to say. Okay. Damn, that was some good poetry, wasn't it? Yes! Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the sort of thing I dig, so thank you, Bruce. Fiction is always more complicated. You've got to give all this context. It's like, and if you would miss one part of it while you're like paying attention to your friend or going to the bathroom or whatever, you're like, huh, what? 
I don't know what's going on. But I, I'm going to do it, friends. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from a chapter. I'll, all of these started off as short stories during my um, master's program at uh, Pacific University in Oregon. That's why I moved to Oregon. Um, this chapter is called Dry Heat. The book centered around this kind of outlaw activist character, this larger-than-life person named Dyson Lave. Um, and he, at this point in the story, he is currently on the run from the FBI for politically motivated crimes of property, aka eco-terrorism, aka monkey wrenching. Um, his crimes took place in the Northwest. Um, shortly before the chapter I'm about to read, the FBI has raided the Black Cat, which is the activist info shop that this character Dyson set up with his girlfriend, Michelle, uh, in this town called Crestop, which is a thinly fictionalized version of Prescott. I do say so myself. In part to support the struggle, the struggle to save the Green River, which in turn is a thinly fictionalized version of the struggle to save the Verde. Um, the book is fiction, those of you who are familiar with the now defunct Catalyst info shop in Prescott, and the ongoing fight to save that river will recognize the true things here. Um, there's also some true things here from the strange tale of Bill Rogers, if any of you know the story of the group of uh, secret radical eco-terrorists. Uh, called The Family, based out of Eugene in the 1990s. Okay, so, they're trying to stop the river. A guy named Bonner owns a ranch. Has, he has tried to stop it by producing grandfathered water rights claims to the water um, that the city would drain by pumping the aquifer for, more de for further development. Um, and then some unknown person set off explosives on the Bonner Ranch. Okay? And I think that's all you have to know. And I'm reading from my frickin' iPad because I have no book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. Dry heat. This is from, told from Michelle's point of view. That's Dyson's girlfriend. A week after the protest at the courthouse, Michelle answered the knock at the back door of the black cat against her judgment before she'd had her coffee. No one she wanted to see would have arrived so early. No one she wanted to see would even have knocked. <laughs> Standing there at the bottom of those loose-nailed steps between the compost bin and the free box were two sunglassed stiffs in suits. Good morning, Ms. McClellan, said suit number one. Nice of you to knock this time. Suit number two nodded, apparently in agreement. We're here to come in, she said. You must be sweating your balls off out there. Whether or not they were in fact sweating their balls off, it was clear that their faces would never betray it, nor would they deign to crack a smile. It was a stupid thing to have said anyway. It was a dry heat, after all. Michelle let them settle in at what passed for a kitchen table at the cat and wiped clean the toffee grinder. She caught a glimpse of suit number one, the near blonde, lanky one. His name, she remembered, was Bates. Surreptitiously swiping the surface of the table as if casing it for crumbs. The other one, darker in complexion and shorter in stature, Solaz, was mildly surveying the contents of the room, that commingled chaos of kitchen implements, cubbies, papers, and pamphlets, outdated computer equipment, found art, folk art, and leftist propaganda that functioned as the black cat's kitchen, dining room, and office. The last time she'd seen these guys, six months previous, had been in a room containing nothing but three chairs and two very bright lights in the basement of a government building somewhere north of Phoenix and east of who the fuck knows where. That's where these guys had taken her in a darkened van 
after they busted into the cat like the building was on fire and screamed at everyone to get down, two days after Dyson disappeared. She'd spent a full 24 hours telling them the truth, which was that she had no idea where Dyson had gone, never mind what he had done back in the day or who he had done it with. The truth had not mattered as far as these goons were concerned. Special agents Bates and Solaz had proven as impervious to her tears, protestations, and various epithets that day as the volcanic rocks surrounding that top secret shithole. Now it was as if the Gestapo was making house calls, or perhaps had dropped in to borrow a cup of sugar. Michelle filled the coffee grinder with beans. She held her finger down on the button for longer than necessary, calming herself as it shrieked, then spoke immediately into the silence. Any progress on the big case? Bates took off his sunglasses and Solas followed suit. It was a gesture no doubt meant to make them seem less scary. But when Bates looked her in the eye, that long day underground, the fundamental fear of it came back to her. We have reason to believe Dyson Lathe may still be in the area, he said. Well then, maybe you should have him give me a call. She turned away again, this time to pour the hot water from the kettle over the grounds in the French press. The steam wavered as she took a breath, steadying herself. You've seen this? When she turned around, Solaz had laid a newspaper on the table and flattened it with his hand. The cover of the local daily detailed the recent fires at the Bonner Ranch apparently started with explosives. The news was a week old, the fires well contained now though a haze still hung in the air north of town. Michelle pretended to study the picture of the blackened, busted cow tank, the bloody corpse of the cow beside it, the plume of smoke in the distance, studying the man's hand instead. It was a wide, brown hand with pale, almost lavender fingernails, anchored by perfect white half-moons. Sola's suit jacket had fallen open unbuttoned, his sole admission to the heat. And in the blur of her peripheral vision, Michelle could see the black strap of the holster against his white shirt, the bulge of the gun below his left shoulder. Would you like some coffee? She asked him. Hey, sure. Why not? Sola spoke without any trace of a regional dialect, like a newscaster. And not for the first time, she wondered where he was from. Of the two suits, he was the one she hated less. With that big nose and those hangdog eyes, he looked like the Gestapo version of Cesar Chavez. <laughs> she turned to Bates. You? Bates looked off into the next room as if she had not spoken. The message was clear in case she'd missed it the first time. He was prepared to ignore anything she said that was not what he wanted to hear. Just sugar, Solaz added. Michelle poured steaming fair trade Honduran into a mug and blazoned with the words, Every bunny needs somebody. Which of course depicted any number of adorable rabbits enthusiastically embracing one another. She ignored the sugar dish on the counter and handed the man his coffee black, looking him in the eye. She hoped her message was clear as well. They were on her turf now. Blaine Contracting reports a burglary from their warehouse shortly before the first explosion, Bates said. Solaz blew across the surface of his ridiculous cup. Your boyfriend, husband, Bates almost smiled at this. Has a history of setting fires. Suddenly, Michelle wanted to A, throw hot coffee in Bates's face, B, bolt from the room, or C, tattoo her forearm in some pleasing rhythmic pattern with the staple gun on the table. 
Also, Bates says, said, evidence suggests he was handy with explosives. If anyone is handy with explosives, she said carefully, it's Blaine. That's who the explosives belong to. Dyson Laid established the Black Cat as a center for action against the pipeline, Bates said. Actually, we established it together. He was a key player in the movement opposing the pipeline. He was on the same side as Vern Bonner. Why would he set off dynamite on the old man's ranch? Bates lifted his chin. Maybe he was attempting to frame Blaine contracting. Michelle set her mug down on the counter beside her. Are you kidding me? Solas said, maybe your boyfriend is trying to turn public sentiment against the developers. Public sentiment is against the developers. Bates' dark eyes settled once more on hers, and Michelle felt her skin prick to Bates' eyes was like looking into still water on a moonless night. Then why have so few expressed opposition to the pipeline, he asked. She pursed her lips. She would not detail the thousands of signatures, the overflowing city council meetings, the surveys they conducted showing widespread support for the cause, contrary to the poll in the newspaper, which everyone knew was in the pocket of George Blaine. The suits were just trying to get her off guard here to let something slip. These stiffs who could not, would not understand that there was nothing she was holding out on, nothing she was holding back. She took a sip of her coffee, then turned to add more sugar. She met Salah's eye as she measured out a heaping spoonful and stirred it into her own cup. He acknowledged this with a slight nod. Whatever else she could say about him, the man wasn't stupid. Tell me, she said, why would Dyson stick around here with assholes like you after him? Maybe he didn't want to leave without you, Salah suggested. Michelle looked around at the hand-woven pot holders, the block print poster from the Black Mesa protest, the reassuring clutter of recycled twist ties and spilled paper clips beside the old computer, which was covered in old band stickers, dead Kennedys, black fire, and Dyson's peeling old steal-your-face with the anarchy symbol lodged inside its skeleton's head. She looked out the w kitchen window at the leaves of the elm outside, to the cottonwoods along Quartz Creek beyond. Part of her wanted to believe it, that Dyson might be somewhere close to these things that reminded her of him, that he might be near to her, biding his time, walking through the willows that grew thick around the springs that fed the green, along those deer trails only he could ever seem to find spending his nights on that old cliff dwelling flush with the red rocks of Sycamore Canyon. But as much as she wanted to believe, she knew it wasn't true. Remember, she said quietly now, when we talked before, you told me not to lie. I'll have to ask the same of you. Bates shifted in his seat almost imperceptibly as if this small movement was all that was necessary to unkink the clockwork of his gears. You believe George Blaine is responsible for the fires at the Bonner Ranch. Bonner is the one who put his pipeline on hold. Blaine owns one of the largest contracting com companies in the state of Arizona. He would have a great deal to lose with such a reckless gesture. Once again, Bates fixed her with those fathomless eyes. Personally, I find that notion too extreme to be believed. Michelle cast a glance at Solas, who was perusing the random pamphlet someone had piled up next to the computer. The computer she and Dyson had gotten donated after the immigration reform protest, when a couple of local rednecks had broken in and smashed up the last one. Everything at the Black Cat was like that, including the pamphlets. Something someone had donated or maybe just left there. A mashup of dissenting viewpoints and visions. A collective effort on the part of an independent people. Yet Solaz was eyeing the clutter as if it could reveal to him the root of some mystery. Proof positive, probable cause. Bates stood. Mind if I take a look around? Actually, I do. 
Here at last he cracked a smile, as if that was a joke on her part. By all means, she said as he swept past her, go check on the bugs you planted. We've had some pretty subversive meetings lately. Maybe you check the schedule? The stitching bitch was a real hit. Not to mention the gender neutral play date. And hey, you never know what kind of wild things you're gonna overhear at the Citizens for Peace potluck. She might as well have been speaking Chinese. She might as well have said, why don't you take a flying fuck at a rolling donut? Why don't you take a flying fuck at the moon? As Bates commenced to whatever pressing business he had in the library, Solaf sipped from his bunny mug, his head tilted slightly. Finally, he said, you believe that George Bain, Blaine does not fear the law. Why would he? His brother-in-law is the sheriff. Solaz seemed to consider that. Then he picked up the pamphlet he'd been studying from the desk beside his chair. Knowledge is power, he read. Stop the worldwide reptile conspiracy. Resist the IMF. Hey man, she said. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not watching you. <laughs> Solaz replaced the pamphlet on the stack of papers beside the desk. He smiled mildly, looking off. Ms. McClellan, do you know the name Judy Berry? Michelle stared at the side of his face, transfixed. Of course she knew that name. And of course he knew that she knew it. Judy Berry was an environmental activist of Dyson's vintage. She'd helped to lead the charge to stop the clear-cutting of California's old growth. And in 1990, on a tour aimed at recruiting students for Redwood Summer, a pipe bomb had exploded under the seat of her car. Do you remember the accident she was involved in? And now Michelle was no longer at the cat, amid the comfort and chaos of thrift store dishes and flyers and folders and old punk posters. She was a hundred feet beneath the surface of the earth in an unnamed government facility she'd been driven to in a darkened van. She was sitting across from this man with the lights in her face, screaming, crying, rocking in her chair. There are people, Sola said quietly, who say Judy Berry was planning to bomb the offices of Pacific Lumber Company. There are people, Michelle said, just as quietly, who believe the FBI planted a bomb in her car. And there are people, Sola said, finishing the last of his coffee, who find that idea too extreme to be believed. Michelle looked down at the floor. It did not matter, she realized, that Solas was Hispanic. It didn't matter where he was from. It didn't matter that he resembled a great union leader, a man of the people. This man was an agent of the state, and what he had just given her was a warning. Thank you. Mm -hmm.